morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to All Things Fulfilled Broadcast. I am William Bell, and with me is Brother Pitt Boss. We are grateful to be here this morning. Brother Pitt Boss, how are you doing? I'm good, Mr. Bell. How are you? This is a great day. Yes, yes. It's uh, always good to be together, to have an opportunity to talk about the Word of God, and we've been getting some very good responses from the lessons that uh, we have been uh, presenting, and we want to continue that. We also appreciate those of you who are in the listening audience and those of you who listen by way of delayed broadcast or you download the archives, and for that we are very, very appreciative. Before we get started this morning, I want to make just a few announcements. First of all, a word from our sponsors. With Builders Floors and Interiors, the full-service floor company offering you discounts on all types of flooring, laminate woods, vinyl, carpet, and ceramic tile. So for any room in your house, they're able to take care of all of your needs with colors, interior uh, decors in terms of your paint colors, your textures, your fabrics, etc., so that you have just the perfect look that you want. Now, they're located in the Wolf Chase Mall, just north uh, or just north of the Wolf Chase Mall in the Bartlett area at 3085 Stage Post Road. That's 3085 Stage Post Road. And the phone number there is 901-382-2155. That's 901-382-2155. Uh, tell uh, Gwen Christensen that uh, you heard all about her on All Things Fulfill, and that um, let her know, and I'm sure she's going to give you uh, not only a great deal, but also excellent service. They have a A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau, and she's been in business over 18 years, so they know what they're doing. If you want your house to look uh, beautiful and to have that look that is going to last for years, not something that you're going to... Try to do on your own and then regret because you didn't pick the right colors, you didn't get everything matching properly. This is the lady that you want to see, and she'll take care of you. That's Builders Floors and Interiors at 3085 Stage Post Road, just north of the Wolf Chase Mall, 901-382-2155, 901-382-2155. Also, we want you to make sure that you get your Bibles and books and whatever you need for your ministry from Servant's Heart Christian Bookstore your one-stop shop for all your church supplies. They're located at 6188 East Shelby Drive, and the phone number is 901-794-3038. Again, that's 901-794-3038. Speak with Mr. Bobby Moraine over there, and uh, be sure and ask him for uh, books by William Bell and Don K. Preston, among other things that you may need. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we want to thank our sponsors once again. If you have an interest in sponsoring the show, just let us know. We'll be happy to uh, announce your business so that we can let people know about what you do as well. So contact us at 901-601-0548. Well, we're down to the real business now in terms of the purpose for which this broadcast is on the air, and I continue to talk to people as a result of the broadcast. I know you've talked to people as a result of the broadcast, and as we said, we're getting some very, very good responses. I also had a conversation with a very prominent gentleman on yesterday, and uh, we're going to see if we can get him interested in at least taking a look at the fulfilled Bible prophecy view, uh, because uh, that could mean some you know, pretty impactful things as we go along, but we also have people, you know, from all spectrums, uh, young uh, and old, and everyone in between, I shouldn't say old, but senior or mature, uh, and everyone in between who are taking a look at these views, and they are very, very challenging for people, and I can understand for people who are hearing it for the first time, um, it will be challenging, it will sort of turn your world upside down. Uh, based on the things that you've been taught. But if you believe in the Bible, if you believe in having a thus says the Lord, as the scripture says in Acts the 17th chapter, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind. Now see, there's a, there's a mindset that you should have when you approach the word of God. And this will keep you from being lifted up with pride, because sometimes pride will keep us from even considering something, and that is to take the approach that the Bereans had when they approached the Scriptures. 
And so Paul said of them, they were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily. Now watch the purpose for which they searched the scriptures. They were not searching the scriptures to find out how to refute somebody's argument. A lot of people take that approach with the Bible. Let me see how I can refute it. They're not even listening to what you say. They just want to let you get it out so they can go try to find a way to refute it. They haven't considered whether the argument or whether the reasoning you have presented has any validity to it. And that will cause us to be blinded to a lot of truth. There are many things that people have approached me with that I thought I knew or that I was totally ignorant of. But I was willing to listen and hear them out to find out whether or not it's true. As a matter of fact, someone just wrote something on Facebook a moment ago, and before I came on the air, I listened to what they had to say. And after listening to it and processing it, it raised some questions, and so I'm going to respond to that. But I did listen to it to see, is this the case? Because basically what they're saying was... The destruction of Jerusalem is our salvation for the most part, or deliverance from that was our salvation, which I don't accept, and I'm not going to get into it right now. I'm going to answer them on Facebook, but what I'm saying is I, I was willing to listen to that and see I read the entire piece, and ladies and gentlemen, this is what you have to do. Now, here's what happens when that occurs. The Scripture says, therefore, when they listened to find out whether it was true, not how they could refute it. Therefore, many of them believed, and also not a few of Greeks, prominent women, as well as men. So that's the purpose of listening to people who teach. I don't care who they are. That's, that's why, personally. I will listen to people who say they are atheists. I will listen to people who say they disagree with me i will listen to people who come from different angles about anything because they are going to give you some knowledge on something and if you have the truth you're fine but guess what what if you are amiss on a passage and that happens to me often i'm, I'm not above being wrong about a text this is why even as I teach, I'm still studying and therefore want to learn. So I'm open, and that's why I leave comments open, even on this broadcast and on the um, YouTube page and on my website, so people can ask me questions, and sometimes I'm corrected. Sometimes I have to correct them. But that's the way it should be, so that we all grow and we all learn in the process. But uh, I think when people think that they have kept all the knowledge, that's the moment that they really lose it. At any rate, let's, uh, let's proceed on uh, with our study today. Now, we were talking, Brother Pitt Boss, on the mystery of God, fulfilling the mystery of God at the sounding of the seventh trumpet. And we started in the book of Revelation. We talked about the two chronological bookends, the temporal bookends of at hand and shortly to come to pass, as well as um, in chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, and also in the um, 22nd chapter, where we had verses 6 through 10. So with all of that, we were showing how the time frame was a short period of time. Now, People will ignore that, and they will take the contents of the book of Revelation out of the first century audience to whom it was originally written, and they will try to insert themselves into that text. That's historically inaccurate. 
how can you be in the first century and in the 21st century at the same time? <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't mm-hmm. make sense. And why would you think that the people who were in the seven churches to whom the book was written, that it was not for them, but it's for you? That's not making very much sense. We've got to think about that and uh, come back and do a little bit better on that one. So we went to chapter 10, and we talked about the mystery, and the Bible says, and in the days when the seventh angel begins to sound, or is about to sound, rather, the mystery of God would be finished as he has declared to his servants the prophets. Now that brings us to another fundamental concept about what we teach, as we call it, covenant eschatology. And uh, in so doing... We are focusing on the things that the prophet spoke. So, Brother Pitboss, I'm going to ask you to, um, to read a scripture or two for us, and I'll give them to you, and then I'll have you read, read them. Uh, the first scripture is going to be Acts chapter 24 and verses... Um, Let's just read verses 13 through 15, Acts 24, 13 through 15. And we're, we're getting into the lesson, but I wanted to just lay this out uh, very quickly so that if he's talking about the things that were declared in the prophets, then we're going to show you that where we're getting our teaching from is actually out of the prophets. All right, so let's, let's have Acts chapter 24, verses 13 through 15. Nor can they prove the things of which they, they now accuse me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a set, I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust, all right, so notice that. He says, this was Paul when he was on trial, and the Jews, the Torah keepers, were accusing him of deviating from Torah. They were saying Paul, because he was teaching the resurrection through Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and because they rejected the Messiah, John 1 and verse 11, he came to his own and his own received him not. So because they rejected the Messiah, they thought that Paul was a heretic, and they charged him as such. And people are still doing that today when you talk about the Messiah. As a matter of fact, I I, uh, listened to some comments on yesterday and uh, uh, responded to a guy, and, and they responded back with me basically saying, you know, Christ was not the Messiah. So uh, that still goes on to this very day. But he said, they can't prove it. He says, neither can they prove the things whereof they accuse me. But this I say that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers. Paul said, I'm still worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law, and in the prophets. So Paul said everything that he was teaching was written in the law and in the prophets. And he says that I have hope of God, which they themselves also accept, that there is about to be. When you look in the original language, it's the same imminent language that you find in the book of Revelation, because they're talking about the same thing. There is about to be, use the word mellow, a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and of the unjust. And so, from that point of view, we have to see that Paul's reference is in the prophets. Now, let's uh, take a look, Brother Pitboss, at another text that we're going to introduce today, and that is in the 27th chapter of Isaiah, because we're talking about the gathering, Isaiah chapter 27, verses 11 and 12. One moment, we're getting there. Uh, Isaiah 11 and 12. When it's 
are bought are withered, they will be broken off. The women come and set them on fire, for it is a people of no understanding. Therefore, he who made them will not have mercy on them, and he who formed them will show them no favor. And it shall come to pass in the day that the Lord will thresh from the channel of the rivers to the book of Egypt, and you will be gathered one by one, O ye children of Israel. All right, read one more verse. I should have given you 12 and 13, but I was multitasking there. So <laughs> go ahead, verse 13. 13. So it shall be in the day that the great trumpet will be blown. They will come who are about to perish in the land of Assyria, and they who are outcast in the land of Egypt, and shall worship the Lord in the holy mount at Jerusalem. All right, very good. So, ladies and gentlemen, we want to focus on Isaiah 27, verses 12 and 13, because Isaiah is one of the prophets that Paul and John are quoting from when they talk about the revelation of the mystery. Now, when we were in Ephesians chapter 3 on yesterday, we defined the mystery for you from the writings of Paul, and we want, to, uh, we want to go back there, and I'm going to come back to Isaiah in just a moment, but I wanted to have that in front of you so that you know, just as Paul said, everything I'm saying was written in the law and in the prophets. So here we are, and we're going to show you that it was written in the uh, law as well, in the Torah. We're going to show you that it was written in the Pentateuch as well as written here in Isaiah in just a moment. But notice... In Ephesians chapter 3, I'm going to repeat what we said yesterday. How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Now, yesterday we had a mystery that we had to solve where Brother Pitboss had something in his pocket, and I thought it was keys, but I couldn't know what was in his pocket until he revealed it to me. And when he revealed that it was a receipt, then I had the same knowledge about what was in his pocket that he had. And that's what Paul is saying. By which, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. Now look at what that mystery was, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise. Now watch this, ladies and gentlemen, because the place of where the gathering occurs is extremely, critically, vitally important. And the very guy who responded to me about Jesus not being the Messiah, etc., and it went diametrically opposed to what we're going to read right now. So I'm going to read it again just so it's fresh in your mind. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise, where? In Palestine. Is that what it says, Brother Pitt Boss? I have, in Christ. In Christ, ladies and gentlemen. In Christ, and through what means? Is it through exactly. the Nakba, the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians? Is it through the U.N. invading Libya? Is it through the plan of globalization of the Zionists? Is it John Hagee's slant on going back to Jerusalem? And now, by the way, he's advocating that the Antichrist is coming in May. 
What a shame. Anyway, let's stay on point. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. So the means by which God was gathering the Jew and the Gentile and the place into which they're being gathered or were being gathered at the time was in Christ. Now, Let's take a look again at Ephesians 2, very quickly. Verse 11, therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh. In the flesh is a covenantal realm. It doesn't mean your biology in every place where you see the word flesh. And I have that conversation and debate with people all the time. But in the flesh simply is a concept it's a covenantal concept, and it had to do with the people who had the circum- covenant of circumcision in their flesh, and so it came to be called the realm of the flesh. It isn't always talking about a sinful state uh, in terms of someone you know, being a prodigal, so to speak. It's not about individuals sinning. This is about a covenantal realm or state wherein these actions that are fleshly as opposed to spiritual occur. And so, therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, so the state of being uncircumcised was called in the flesh. By what is called circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ. So you had this group of people who were uncircumcised. Call them what you will, as I said on yesterday. They could be Jews, that is, of the Israel that was cut off, the tribes that were cut off according to Hosea and Second Kings 17, where God said, I will not be your people, I mean, I will not be your God, and you will not be my people. But he prophesied that one day, within the last days, they would. And we're looking at those last days, and I'm going to show you that very clearly. All right, and then he said, And strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, look at where it is. And this is at the time Paul wrote in the first century. He said, Now, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ, by the blood of Messiah, is what he's saying, by the blood of the anointed one. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself. Look at where the creation is, ladies and gentlemen. People are looking for a creation of a physical world somewhere. The scripture says the creation is in himself. It is in Christ. That's where you are recreated. And that does not involve a change in your physical or biological makeup. Nicodemus thought that in John chapter 3, when the Lord, uh, he came to the Lord by night saying, Rabbi, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles which you do unless or except God is with him. And so the Lord said to him, except a man is born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Nicodemus' mind said, okay, where do I get this new body? How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb? I didn't have as much appreciation for that text when I read it as a young man. (laughs) Brother Mm -hmm. Pitboss, as I do today, (laughs) I'm an older man. So now when he says, how can a man when he is old enter into his mother's womb again and be born? I get his point. 
How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb? That's not the kind of birth Jesus was talking about. It's not biological birth. It's a birth that you receive when you enter into the Lord Jesus by covenant. And that is the terms of the new covenant because his blood was shed for the new covenant for the remission of sins. And when you enter that covenant through faith and baptism, you receive remission of your sins, forgiveness of your sins. Now, verse 16, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body. So that's the same thing that Ephesians is talking about. This is the gathering, ladies and gentlemen, because it was a gathering of Jew and Gentile into one body. through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity, and came and preached peace to you who were far off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father, restored back to the presence of the Father. Now, if you are waiting on Benjamin Netanyahu in Israel to build you a third temple, so you can go into the most holy place of that temple, and it won't be a most holy place. But what they are going to call the most holy place, if you're waiting to go into there to be with the Father, you're going to miss it. Because he says through him, through Jesus Christ. You remember when Jesus made the statement in John 14? As a matter of fact, we talked about that a few days ago, when we talked about Christ saying he was, uh, let not your heart be troubled, you believe in God, believe also in me, in my Father's house are many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will come again, and there receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now watch this text. He came and preached peace to you who are afar off, and to those who were near, for through him, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. That's why Jesus said, I am the way, the life, and the truth. No man comes to the Father except by me, except through him. And this is why, and the temple is right here, ladies and gentlemen. I'm just going to read the end of this chapter. Here is the temple right in the context as a result of, of gathering them back to the Father, because the Father, that's his presence. And I'm going, to t I'm going to talk about that presence in a moment, so people, I hope they get it. It's one of my favorite, favorite concepts in all the Bible. The Scripture says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners. Now remember, they have to sign up at the temple, a foreigner cannot enter beyond this point. So whomever he's talking to in Ephesians, he says, you are no longer a stranger and a foreigner. And that referred to the uncircumcised. And as I said yesterday, if Israel was cut off because they were uncircumcised, then they were no longer God's people. And he told them that. You are not my people. I will not be your God. So it didn't matter whether they had the blood of Abraham in their veins, because we know those northern tribes did have Abraham's blood in their veins. But if they're cut off because of disobedience, then they are no longer God's people. That's what we've got to get across to people, ladies and gentlemen, because they think just because they have a DNA connection, that makes them worthy. That is the epitome of pride. John the Baptist told them in John chapter 3, he says, Do not think to say within yourselves that you are the children of Abraham. You know why they were saying that? Because they had his DNA. And then he said, God is able of these stones to raise up children of Abraham. Therefore, bring forth fruits of what? Of repentance. So it has to be the godly life that makes that distinction. But now let's read on. 
Therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the what? Household of God. The household of God is the temple, ladies and gentlemen. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Now watch this. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now what did the scripture say about the chief cornerstone in Isaiah chapter 28 and verse uh, 11? Or excuse me, verse 16. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes on him will not act hastily. So whoever believes will not act hastily. When you trace that stone out in the New Testament, in Matthew chapter 21, when you look at it in Acts 4, 11, neither is there salvation in any other. Well, he tells you this is the stone which the builders rejected, which is set at naught by you builders, the same which has become the head of the corner. He's talking about Jesus Christ. He is the foundation stone. So for everyone who rejects the Messiah, what are you doing? You're rejecting the foundation stone of the temple of God. In whom the whole building, verse 21, back to Ephesians 2, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Now, I challenge anybody out there to show me where the Lord was going to build two temples. One of mortar and one of the Lord Jesus Christ. In whom the whole building, fitly, or being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In whom, see, we're still in Christ. Everything is still working in Christ. You following with me on that, Brother Pitboss? I'm right there with you. All right. The whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. That's Ezekiel 37, ladies and gentlemen. I will dwell in them. I will walk in them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. God's not trying to walk in a building made of mortar. He wants to walk and dwell in you. And you become a part of the building of the temple when you enter Christ. But at any rate, we're talking about the gathering. So let's, um, let's go back. We're, we're talking about Jew and Gentile. Now let's go over to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 10. When would that occur? Well, before I go to 10, let's go to, let's go to Isaiah so we can pick this up because we're running quickly out of time. I don't know how it happens. Do you know how it run, passes so fast? <laughs> <laughs> when you're having a good time, time passes by fast. Okay. So in Isaiah 27, you read it earlier, 12 and 13, he says, and, in, and it shall come to pass in that day. Now, when you see in that day, ladies and gentlemen, this is the day of the Lord. And in this case, it's the eschatological day. When, when I say eschatological, that's just a big fancy word. I'm going to break it down for you. Um, Eschatos means last or final. Logos means word. And so it's the word or study of last things. So that's where we get the term eschatology. Eschatological is just an adjective form of the word. And so... He says, it shall come to pass in the last day that the Lord will thresh. Now, Brother Pitt Boss, do you know what threshing is? It's an agricultural Uh, concept. uh, uh, I mean, I kind of, in my mind, it's it's like 
threshing is to kind of thrust. I kind of go to thrust. <laughs> With like grain, okay? You know how you have the mm-hmm. grain and it has the, the husks on the grain? Ah, like yes, yes. All the chaff, okay? Yes. So in other words, he's going to thresh in that day. And what they would do is they would take a, a wide shovel or, you know, fork or whatever, and they would throw the grain up in the air against the wind. And as they threw it, the, the, the husk, which is lighter than the seed inside, the grain inside, the husk would be blown away. You know, like you get some peanuts that have been roasted, right? And you have the little mm-hmm. thin husk on the end, and you pick them up, and that little husk falls off, right? Well, mm-hmm. this is what they would do with the wheat and, and, um, and with the barley, etc. So they'd throw it up against the wind, and the wind would blow the chaff away. So that's called threshing. And then the, the grain would fall to the ground, and then they would, of course, sift and sieve that, so through a, uh, sift it through a sieve so they can get all the dust and everything off of it and you know, get it clean. But that's how he separated the unedible and the unusable from that which was good. Well, this is an analogy. It's an illustration. This is what God was going to do to Israel in the last day. He was going to thresh them from the channel of the river, and that river is the river Euphrates, so that's like the northern extremity, to the brook of Egypt. And he says, and you will be gathered one by one. So we're talking about the gathering, right? And since the gathering is the mystery, we're talking about the mystery, ladies and gentlemen, and we're going to show you that because the mystery takes place at the sounding of the last trumpet. So the gathering and the mystery have to be the same in terms of the time in which they occur. You will be gathered one by one, O children of Israel. Now, Brother Pitt Boss, after listening to this text talk about the threshing, would you say that every single person who had Abraham's DNA was going to be saved? I would not. That's exactly right. Because if that were the case, what's the need of threshing anybody, right? That's correct. So when the scripture even teaches all Israel shall be saved, ladies and gentlemen, you can't save all Israel without threshing some of them out. So you can get true Israel, separating them from the bad. Verse 13, so it shall be in that day, the great trumpet will be blown. Well, the gathering, the scripture says, and in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound, the mystery of God will be finished as he has declared to his servants, the prophets. We're reading one of the prophets. The great trumpet will be blown and they will come who are about to perish in the land of Assyria. Now, wait a minute. Here are people that are going to come out of Assyria. Now, we know where Assyria is, right? It was located on the Tigris River. So you have the Euphrates and you have the Tigris running in that area. Babylon on the Euphrates, Assyria on the Tigris. So he says, those who will come, or they will come, who are about to perish in the land of Assyria. So that would be the northernmost extremity. And then he says, and they who are outcast in the land of... Now you're hitting into the south. So we got people coming from the north and the south being gathered at the last trumpet. Now, if you believe the Bible, you must believe that. But, Pit Boss, you remember we were talking in Ephesians? Can you tell us where they would be gathered? Do you remember where the text said where they were being gathered? 
I believe it's the Holy Mount at Jerusalem. And there was another friend. You're correct. But where? In Christ. In Christ. You remember that phrase, right? Yes, sir. In Christ. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we've talked about that mountain before, but we'll talk about it again. Um, I'm not going to cover it now because I want to tie something together before we close this uh, message for you today. But the gathering would take place in Christ. Now, let's, let's cover that very quickly as we are, are closing. In Ephesians, the first chapter, verse uh, 10, 9 and 10. Now, watch this. We're talking about the mystery here. Having made known to us the mystery of his will. So we're still dealing with the mystery. According to his good pleasure, which he has purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times. Now, underline that phrase, ladies and gentlemen, fullness of the times. Here's what I want to say about it. When we read Galatians, the fourth chapter, and verse 4, the Bible says, But when the fullness of the times had come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under Torah, made under the law. But Christ came in the fullness of time. So why are people wanting to say the fullness of time has not yet arrived? when Jesus came in the fullness of the time. And this is what he said during the time of his ministry in Mark chapter 1, verse uh, 14 and 15. This is after John the Baptist had been cast into prison. The scripture says that Jesus came into the coast, uh, or came into Galilee after John was cast into prison, after preaching, um, uh, preaching the kingdom of God, the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, the time is fulfilled. The word used there for fulfilled is pleroma. It might be pepleroma, which is a perfect tense. But what it means is that the time has been fulfilled and stands fulfilled, and therefore you can't find another time to fulfill it. It has come into being and exists as the fulfilled time. Is that making sense, Brother Pitboss? Most definitely. And since it was the fulfilled time, which means that he's speaking of the appointed time that Daniel talked about, who prophesied about the coming of the kingdom, and the kingdom of, he says, and saying, same thing he said in the book of Revelation, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand, has drawn near, repent, and believe the gospel. But this happened in the fullness of the time. And yet people are out there on the street screaming to the top of their voices, it's the last days, Jesus is about to come. 200 million warriors are coming out of the heavens. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says the time was fulfilled in the first century, and it stood as fulfilled. Jesus himself came in the fullness of the time, but he came born of a woman born under Torah. That is before Christianity had started, because Christianity starts through the death of Christ. Now, so in verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together. See, there's the gathering. Where are they coming from? You remember those two places we just mentioned in Isaiah 27 and verse 13? Where are they coming from? Out of where? Assyria. And out of Egypt. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, this is the gospel being preached to people because they were going to be gathered through the gospel. We read that earlier in Ephesians. Go back and listen to the, to the tape or to the recording if you missed that. But they're gathered 
in Christ. And this is what he's telling you right here. That in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one the uncircumcised and the circumcised. The cut off and those who had not yet been cut off. Who were not cut off. Who were still in the covenant. And by dying with Christ, entered into the new covenant. So he says that he might gather together in one all things in Christ, not only on earth. He says, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Now, Brother Pitt Boss, can you imagine being gathered together with the people in heaven mm. as well as the people on earth in Christ. Mm. That's some pretty big gathering. Now, ladies and gentlemen, in the words of the late, great, Honorable Marcus Garvey. Do you remember that quote, Brother Pitboss? About trading an island for what? For a continent. He said, I wouldn't trade an island for a continent. Well, ladies and gentlemen, would you trade heaven and earth, a gathering of heaven and earth for a strip of land in Palestine. Even if you have to acquire it by theft and genocide. People need to wake up. They need to think. I want to make this last point. I know we're over time, but I want to make this, I want to make this last point. I want to make two quick points. Since the gathering is in Christ, in Colossians 1.27, I just have to put this in, and then I'm going to end with my little, little uh, favorite little story or, or passage. In Colossians 1.26 and 27, he says, the, uh, well, to get a good, good thought, he says, of which, I'm going to read verse 25, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you, to fulfill the word of God. Remember, everything would be finished when the angel sounded, as he has declared to his servants the prophets. The mystery would be finished. So watch, verse 26. The mystery which has been hidden ages and from generations, same thing he said in Ephesians 3, but now, that's the first century, has been revealed to his saints, to them God will to make known what are the riches of of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, so we're talking about the uncircumcised, which is Christ where, Brother Pitboss? In you. In you, the hope of glory. So here's the mystery, ladies and gentlemen. The mystery was for us to be in Christ and for Christ to be in us. That's the gathering. And it was the gathering of the uncircumcised and the circumcised to all come into one body. Now I want to end on this point, because we're talking about being in the presence of the Father. During the time of the Exodus, after Israel had committed sin against God by making the golden calf, when Moses went up to get the tablets to receive the commandments of God and after that event when God was figuring out what he was going to do to the people he told Moses he says you step aside Moses because I'm going to consume them in a moment God was going to destroy the whole nation so Moses 
interceded on behalf of Israel. And God told him, he says, look, Moses, I will take you and make a new nation just with you alone. I'll start it over with you, Moses. Moses was so unselfish. He said to God, he says, God, if you do not bring your people up out of this wilderness, all the nations round about will say that you have failed and that you have allowed us to be destroyed in this wilderness. And so God responded to him. He said, Moses, my presence will go with you. You know what Moses said? Moses understood what being in God's presence was all about. People who want to go to Palestine need to get this. Moses said, Lord, if you do not go with me, I do not want to leave even this wilderness. Now, you know how much Israel wanted to go into the promised land. You know how much even Moses, at his death, how much he wanted to go. But he told God, if your presence doesn't go with, it, with me, I would rather stay right here in the wilderness where you are. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to get that. Because the house of God, the presence of God, is where God is. And it had nothing to do with the land. Moses understood that. Abraham did too. I don't have time to go into the part with Abraham. We'll have to get him on next week. But the point being is Moses knew that the land of Israel, even though that was one of, a part of the promise that God gave them, that it was not the ultimate of being in the presence of God. That's what Jesus Christ brought to us. And with that, we're going to have to say we've got to end this broadcast because I'm already over time and um, want to take just a moment, first of all, to thank Brother Pitt Boss for being with us today and helping us out. I uh, appreciate your comments and your reading. Uh, thanks to our sponsors, Builders Floors and Interiors, located at 3085 Stage Post Road, just north of the Wolf Chase Mall, handling all of your flooring needs from laminates, carpets, vinyl, and ceramic tile. And also Servant's Heart Bookstore, located at 6188 East Shelby Drive, uh, in the Hickory Hill and Kirby Parkway area, phone number 901-794-3038. With that, ladies and gentlemen, Brother Pitt Boss, give us a closing word. Well, uh, just in quick, uh, I did have a question that I wanted to kind of put out there for uh, one of the callers who called in, and sure. they were concerned about the generations in Matthew twenty four thirty four, where it says, um, yeah, I'm here, uh, to get to it. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by, by no means pass away, to all these things place. <clears throat> and so I'd just like to refer them to uh, Matthew 1 and 17, where it gives an account of how long generations can occur. And it says, so all the generations of Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David until the captivity in Babylon are 14 generations. And from captivity in Babylon until the Christ, are 14 generations. So just by showing this time period of how generations are being counted, then it is clear to understand that when Jesus makes the statement that this generation shall not pass, he is definitely not talking about several thousand years. Okay, very good, because each time a person was born, when it says Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judah and his brothers, each time there was a begetting, that was the beginning of a new generation, right? And that's right. Uh, Because that's what he says. And if you count all of those generations up, they total up to be 42 generations. And if you divide them um, by... Um, Three. Uh, I lost, lost my thought. Uh, you three. will get well, yeah, but you got four. You got three sections of of, gener, of uh, fourteen. All right, which yeah. comes to forty two generations. Well, basically, what they equal up will be somewhere around forty years. Now, let me give you a passage. Um, I drew a blank there. Let me give you a, a passage in Hebrews chapter three that pretty much tells you the length of a generation. And uh, but 
the point that you made is very, very appropriate. But I want to give you this. In, in Hebrews 3 and verse 7, it says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the day, or, excuse me, as in the rebellion, in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works 40 years. Now notice he says they saw his works 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation. So a generation equals approximately 40 years. And um, this is the way that it's used in Matthew chapter 1. Uh, I think it comes out to be about 42 or 43 years based on the calculation, but my brain has gone tired now that I can't even figure out uh, what I did to calculate it. But at any rate, ladies and gentlemen, that's, that's pretty much it. You'll see that a generation is approximately uh, 40 years. And uh, so within that generation, within that 40-year period, and if you count the time from Jesus' ministry to 70 A.D., you're within about a 40-year period and that's why he said all these things, this generation rather, would not pass away till all these things took place. All right. Is that it, Brother Pitboss? That's it. I appreciate the study today. All right. Well, very good, ladies and gentlemen. Well, with that, we're going to say good morning to you. You have a wonderful weekend, and we'll be back with you on Monday. Um, we may decide to do a, a weekend special broadcast, but, you know, we'll, we'll just um, uh, do that. But in the meantime, our regular scheduled broadcast is going to be on Monday at 1130 Eastern Time until 1215. Uh, with that, uh, God bless you, and, uh, and as you know, sometimes we go over a little bit, but uh, God bless you and God keep you, and, and we'll look forward to studying with you again.